Hi, I'm Andrew Wasson. Thanks for tuning in to my weekly guitar blog. It is Saturday, June 11th, 2011, and we're going to start off with a question from Eric in Zion, Illinois. He wrote in saying, I was wondering what chords would be good to add a dramatic sound to a progression. I've been looking for years and I can't seem to find an answer to this question. I was also wondering what chords would be good for R&B music. Okay, so let's start off with chords that enter in a very dramatic effect. Now we could start very simple with this uh, concept by maybe taking on some suspended chords, those uh, sus fours. Now those come in with a very dramatic and dissonant sound and then they resolve and I was going into a dominant chord there itself is a very dramatic type of sound. Those dominants are slightly dissonant, but they allow for diatonic uh, chords that are very consonant and stable to resolve in a strong way. So my suggestion is to look at the suspended fourths uh, in the dominant category of chord if you want to have a very strong type of a resolution, or if you're dealing with something that you don't really want that kind of impact, that kind of strength there, just go with the, let's say a triad uh, style idea where you're, let's, I'm just gonna take a standard D major chord, but I'm gonna do the suspended fourth off of it. So we have a little bit of an effect there of uh, resolution. So suspended chords can be really good. Uh, also, the way that you invert chords can also play quite a role because let's say, for instance, you just were going to use an E major somewhere, or you were going to play a song and it just happened to have E major in it. You know, you're not going to get the same kind of uh, impact out of that as if you maybe did an inversion where perhaps you took the third, let's say, and you, the G sharp, and you put that in the bass and created a new voicing. Now, you, <clears throat> as you well probably know already, an E major chord would like to do a resolution into an A major chord. That would be the traditional 5-1 resolution. So the E major with the inverted uh, major third in the bass, the G sharp in the, the bass in this case here, uh, we're going to hear much stronger of a pull into the root of that A than as if we just played a traditional, let's say, open E major to an A, open A. You can hear that pull over. So those chords are quite dramatic as well. Now, these don't really give you the kind of impact, however, of the next type of chord that I'm going to introduce to you, which is the altered chord. We were talking before about how there's a real dramatic sense with dominance when they resolve. They become extremely dynamic and, and very uh, interesting when you include alter tones. Here's an alter tone of a flat nine. <clears throat> and here that's very powerful. Here's a sharp nine heading to the flat nine. Very cool sound. Now <clears throat> that's even more effective when you go into a minor. Check this out. Same chords, but into instead of G major resolution, we're going to go G minor. So that's a really good sound. Here's an example of another type of an alter. This is a sharp five, and we're going to pull this sharp five into a C major from a G dominant seventh sharp five into C major. And that was a sharp five, but I could even do a flat five into C major. Instead of going upwards on that second string, however, I'm going to go downwards with it. So you can hear that's an interesting resolution downwards with the G7 flat five heading to C major. And then the other one, uh, the first one I did was a G7 sharp five heading to the C major. So here's some great examples for you that can introduce these sounds. Now, another thing I want to do though for you is I want to suggest uh, a, song, a couple of songs, let's say, that you can go and uh, chase after in, uh, in that sort of gospel direction R&B sound where you have really strong resolutions. I'd like you to check out a tune by uh, one of my favorite guitar players, Robin Ford, great guitarist, great songwriter. 
And the song I'd like you to go to on that, uh, on that front is a song called Revelation. And I believe it was on, I'm going to guess here, but I think it was a 1988 uh, album. And I believe the album was called For Your Daughter, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Maybe you can do... Um, a search on a, a website like Amazon or something and um, you know they're usually categorized they have the songs and the albums very well categorized usually on Amazon you could, I guess you could hit iTunes as well but um, the song again is called Revelation it's from the 80s and artist again Robin Ford that song has some fantastic gospel style uh, blues R&B type resolutions with some very powerful chord changes um, so definitely check that one out. Now, in the real uh, classic R&B direction, I'm going to suggest Al Green's famous song, Let's Stay Together. That is a great example to some of those nice minor seven sounds. And then up to, you know, some of those nice minor nines. Some dominance. Maybe even dominant nine. So check that out, that Al Green's Let's Stay Together. That's a great song to study, to come up with a very good picture for yourself of what's happening with some of those nice classic R&B sounds. And you know, if you wanna look into some of the modern music too, I'd highly suggest an artist like Alicia Keys. She's fantastic for the types of uh, chords that she's injecting in her different pieces there. So definitely check that out. But you'll get the most out of learning other people's songs. So most certainly take that direction for yourself. It's gonna be the best direction to really get any kind of style of music. I know we're kind of talking about R&B and some gospel stuff here, but really, you know, any style you wanna learn, the direction you gotta take with it is to go after artists that are writing in the style that you wanna play in one day. So let's go to the next question now. And uh, the next one's coming to us from Ian. He wrote in saying, I'm not really sure when and where to use hybrid picking. There are a ton of places where I feel it may be useful, but I'm not sure what the proper technique is. For instance, when I'm playing a root position, minor seven chord, starting on the E string, should I strum through and mute the appropriate strings or should I use hybrid picking for it? Well, let's talk about this a little bit. Hybrid picking is a very flexible type of technique. You can use it if you're doing a technique in, uh, mostly found in jazz, called comping, where you'll have some chord changes. And you can hear I'm bouncing that root note with my pick, and then I'm also using my middle ring and uh, small finger to do the plucking. So it's kind of a comping idea, and you could even just cut that down. You could do a couple of hits on a chord. Let's say I'm going to go... Uh... So I'm not doing as uh, thorough of a bounce technique off of the chords as I did in the first example I played. But you get an idea that uh, there, there's a different kind of an approach, it's, and it's not the strum approach. It's, it's more of a... A, a cooler sound, you know, uh, and when I, I mean, I don't mean, you know, hip and all that. I mean, it's, it's just got a very smooth kind of sound about it to do comping uh, or hybrid, and you call it hybrid picking. Now, you can go a step further with that, though, and you can develop a pattern with your hybrid picking. So instead of plucking the chord like that, you could inject a pattern into there. hybrid picking idea but I'm doing it with a pattern and I'm going through the pattern and creating a cycle and there's more of a, a, a series of tones now that are going through the changes so it's uh, it, it's sort of a more lyrical way to play through a set of chords because you're hearing all the punches of every note of the chord and again I mean you could do that with cross picking and some string picking and you know string skipping stuff but it's just not really the same kind of smooth sound that you get with your fingers and your fingernails. Um, in fact, if you really want to smooth that out, just go straight to finger style and use your thumb to smooth out all those bass notes now and you get much more even tone. If you're using the hybrid style with the pick on the lower string, you're basically getting a, more of an attack off that low string so it's louder, it's more definition on that low note. So. Um, 
if you want to check out my hybrid picking video on the Creative Guitar Studio YouTube channel, I go into a lot of detail about the approach of hybrid picking. But it sounds like, you know, when I read Ian's email here, he's just not really sure about the technique and, you know, how to uh, apply the technique. Um, he's saying here, like, for instance, um, should I strum through and mute appropriate strings or should I, you know, use uh, hybrid for situations when I have, let's say, a minor seven chord starting on the E string. So um, really, it's up to you and it's also a little bit in respect of the type of style of music that you're playing. So if it's going to be a style where, you know, the artist that you're covering or the artist that you're trying to project that type of musical situation from, um, it has a more defined sound off of the, uh, the pick attacks on the strings, um, then maybe that might be a good idea to just play all pick in, the, in that situation. Um, if it's not quite like that, if it has more of a bounce and you can really hear that real plucked aspect, that real um, you know, hybrid comping style approach, then of course that's what you want to go with. Now there is a bit of muting because you, you, you know, Ian, in Ian's email, he did go and mention about the muting technique. And the muting idea is just that the fingers come back around again. I don't know how well you can see that. But my fingers come back around again and touch the strings to create a bit of the, the deadening sound. You know, so all my fingers do come in and they, they kill out some of the resonance of the strings. So there is some other techniques going on in the detail end of approaching hybrid, but for use and application, it comes down to, again, appropriateness you know, for the piece of music and for the style of music that you're covering. So my suggestion would be to practice this in, in many ways, you know, practice it with a, you know, the, the, the more bounce style like we were doing in our jazz exam, our jazzy, you know, swing style uh, in the first example. So you could do something like that uh, as one practice approach. And then you can also do a practice approach where you're kind of like, you know, just letting them resonate more, you know. Now the other option is, of course, the pattern approach, which is very good. I really highly suggest uh, practicing something like this, you know. So you can hear in there there's the um, approach where I'm going through and plucking strings and creating different kinds of patterns along the way. <clears throat> you can just sit, go through harmonies, you know, pick a key, maybe pick the key of F and go through the harmony along the strings and come up with some exercises with that. Hopefully that helps you out. Let's hit uh, the next question. Now, this next question is very interesting. It's coming to us from Stephen out in Philadelphia. He wrote in saying, I'd like to get some information about starting a music theory lessons website. What programs are good to make websites with? And what would you suggest when it comes to selling products online? A shopping cart company like Yahoo Small Business or the installation of a shopping cart system such as Xcart? I noticed that you use PayPal, but your shopping cart seems unique on your site. Is there any reason for that? And why don't you process credit cards yourself instead of using PayPal? Sorry for all the questions, but I really want to be doing what you're doing one day and I hope you'll answer my question. So I'm going to keep your questions actually in front of me here because you got a lot of them. But I'll go through them uh, step by step and hopefully give you, the, you know, some answers that you can utilize. Uh, okay, so first of all, um, what programs are good to make websites with? Well, if you're asking a question like that, um, right away I'm going to suggest that you find somebody who can sit down with you and discuss what kind of computer you're using, what your intentions are, and what you want to do online. Because there's a lot of programs out there that will make websites. Um, there's uh, complex ways to go about it with HTML code and CSS and PHP script and so on. And there's other ways that are less complex um, where a, like the program itself will do a lot of that for you, uh, such as a program like Adobe's Dreamweaver. Now, these programs are not overly complex to use, but you do have to understand quite a bit in order to use them. 
and they operate in conjunction with an FTP system, uh, which is the transfer protocol where you're going to be dumping and retrieving files from off the internet. And there's a lot of programs that will do that too. Uh, common ones are FileZilla, uh, other ones that get encryption going. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with a lot of them, but you know, there's, there's ones that use the secure shell access. You're going to have to learn a lot about this stuff Find some that you find intuitive and easy to understand and stick with those and start getting into the process of learning about that stuff. So um, you gotta find somebody that's gonna basically teach you this stuff. This is what I did. I found someone, I paid them a hourly wage and they came in and they worked with me for a while and they helped me uh, learn how to use the programs and how to use some of the systems and it uh, was invaluable. I, I needed that because I was probably at the level that you were at when I started all this. Um, now, let's go onwards here. What would you suggest when it comes to selling products online? A shopping cart company like Yahoo Small Business or the installation of a shopping cart system such as Xcart. I noticed that you use PayPal. Okay, well, well okay, let's put the brakes on there. Let's not go too deep into this yet. First of all, uh, when it comes to shop, shopping cart systems, you will need, again, someone that's sort of an expert in that stuff to be able to set that stuff up for you because uh, that stuff involves some very serious coding and it also involves some serious work with a server side software where it's building off of databases that are gonna be inside of a server side system. So that stuff is beyond most people who are not very good at utilizing it. So again, you're just like you would have found someone to teach you how to build the basic website, you're going to have to find someone again who can be your go-to person, your IT person if you want to call it that, that will actually set that stuff up. That stuff involves some serious skill in coding and there's also a lot to do with those systems that are, um, I guess, security based. So you want your system to be fairly secure so it doesn't get hacked. Um, now it uh, still could get hacked and it still will be the, um, the, 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 there'll be effects upon it that will be involved in people attacking it with malware and all kinds of uh, um, just rude, uh, silly, you know, things to disrupt site service. And um, I liken it basically to, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning and you go outside and someone's spray painted on your fence or, you know, somebody uh, kicked out a window on your car while you were asleep or somebody slashed your tires of your car or something. You know, this is the kind of thing I equate it to. It's just, it's just absolute nonsense, but there's loads and loads of people out there that are attacking sites. They're trying to find vulnerable scripts. And another side of this too is over the years, let's say you establish a, a shopping cart system here in 2011. Well, the very good chances are that by about 2014, things are gonna be quite different and the scripts that you will have used will be very old and out of date and probably able to hack and people will attack you. It's just kind of silly. <clears throat> so I'm not even gonna really, get into commenting on whether to use Yahoo uh, Small Business or Xcart or any of these services uh, because you will need to discuss this with the person that you decide to hire on as your technical support person that will be in charge of that stuff. It's not as simple as just finding a script and then installing and running a script and uh, maybe getting a person in once to uh, set it all up. You, you're gonna need somebody that you're gonna work with over the years and who will also be there to help you when the unfortunate time comes when you get attacked by some uh, hacker or someone who's just trying to you know, take your site down for fun. Because that's what they do, you know, just like they, you know, there's, you know, nut jobs out there who will slash the tires of your car as, you know, it's sat in the parking lot when you're sleeping in your apartment. The same thing goes for websites, you know, when you, you, know, you wake up one day and your website's not working because somebody basically attacked it. So, uh, okay, so anyway, um, I will comment though, however, on PayPal. I chose to go with PayPal because number one, PayPal accepts credit cards. So, you know, if you wanted to do uh, MasterCard, Visa, Discovery, whatever the card is, they accept all the cards. They also accept e-checks. So if you want to do a direct uh, switch, you know, money off of your bank account through PayPal, you can do e-check. If you want to do um, a payment from your PayPal account, you know, loads and loads and loads of people, more people all the time are establishing PayPal accounts. Um, so my uh, decision was to go with PayPal uh, and the other side of it is I'm dealing with a third party uh, that has 
a way bigger technical team, way bigger IT department than I could ever possibly afford. They are worldwide. They have um, a very good reputation. I mean, a lot of people, it's so funny, you, you do a search on PayPal and there's a lot of people who are saying PayPal's a scam, PayPal ripped me off. Um, honestly, I've worked with PayPal for uh, probably, I started working with PayPal um, about 10 years ago. I've had a PayPal account with them for absolutely ages uh, because uh, back in the early 2000s, I was big into buying stuff off eBay, had a PayPal account for that. I've never had a problem with PayPal. I firmly believe that uh, people who have PayPal problems are people who are scamming or something or trying to rip you know, PayPal off or trying, they tried to rip somebody else off. Um, you know, there's uh, people who uh, just, you know, even when I used to do a lot of buying and stuff off eBay, there's people out there who are just scammers, you know, they're, and you know, they scam you, they scam PayPal, they scam eBay, they scam probably everybody they deal with. And um, that's the situation. So I've never had a problem in my, you know, I've, I've all the years of using PayPal. And uh, I, I chose them to go with my shopping cart system on my site. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I think that's it. That's basically all the questions that, uh, that Stephen had. Now, unfortunately, Stephen, uh, those probably weren't the questions that you were hoping for, but um, dealing with the web is a very uh, intricate thing to deal with because uh, there, all, there is always something that will be going wrong. You know, sometimes people will e start emailing me when handouts don't go up fast enough. And, you know, sometimes it's a time constraint because I can get really busy around the studio. Sometimes it's actually internet problems. You know, there could be somebody who's uh, basically trying to do a malware attack on the site. I got to leave it alone for a few days. I got to let my IT guy check it out and maybe uh, rewrite some code, maybe take a few things off, maybe actually put some new code in there to just build one more layer of security on the site before I go in. Um, and again, that's where PayPal comes in really handy because if somebody did make a purchase off of the shopping cart system on my site, it's going directly into PayPal situ uh, server situations there. It's very, very secure. And like I said, they have a huge IT department I and mean, they have way more money that they can put into that kind of thing than I can ever have. So I think to myself, well, why would I want to have uh, my all of my own setup going through uh, my own secure shell approach? Uh, I mean, maybe it would be different if I was doing, you know, $10,000 of business a day uh, because uh, obviously the PayPal fees would start becoming an issue in, in that kind of business model. So it might not be efficient anymore. So there's so much to consider on this. Um, that's why I'm saying you got to find somebody who's really an expert and start working with some experts and find yourself a decent hosting company that will really be supportive uh, of uh, what it is that you want to do. Um, so. There you go, there's my two cents worth. But anyway, that's about all the time that I have for today. Thanks for watching and for sending in all the great questions. Have yourself a wonderful week and I'll catch up with you next time. Bye for now.